So tonight you're going to lead us on part of the conversation, and it has to do with Jamaica's economic growth prospects. The PIOJ just had their or released their growth estimates last week. So, and you're also going to touch a bit on inflation. But first, give us the highlights on growth for Jamaica. Um, can I share? Can I share yes, the of course. Yes. Yep, in a second. All right. So as you while All you right, share yes. that screen is coming up. All right, yes, there it is. All right. So just to I guess take it from take, take it from the top. The light has gone. All right. Light back. So in the, the PIOJ has reported 1.9% growth for the first quarter of this year. And they indicate that this growth is largely due to increasing external demand, high levels of business and consumer confidence, increased agricultural output, which uh, we, 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 do, we do know and we do acknowledge, as well as higher alumina production. Um, the graph there shows us our annual growth rate from 2013 to 2023. And we're seeing pre-COVID, we were at 1%. The COVID dip, about almost 10%. And last year we settled at about 2.6%. So we're just about in we're just about in that same positive range. And um, the projections are there as well. So anywhere between two and three percent, world um, World Bank is projecting that we are projecting. Um, somewhere along that line as well, so is the BOJ. In terms of the actual summary, um, in looking at the varying industries, you can break out the can break out the industries into the top performers and the worst performers. So our top performers have been mining and acquiring, which was up close to 25%, agriculture, which was close to 8%, electricity, water supply, and hotel and restaurants are essentially tourism. The worst performance being construction and government services. Interesting. Um, if I can, I can actually jump into a discussion of those top uh, of those top and top and um, worst performers. Absolutely. But just before that, but just before that, I wanted to show the economy, the economy makeup. So based on the sectors that both PIOG and Statin track, this is this is how our Jamaican economy looks. So distribution is our largest sector, um, wholesale, retail, trade, installation, mach machinery is the real is the real name. And then we have government services, financial services, transport, manufacturing, and it goes all the way down to mining and quarrying based on the, the different sizes. So essentially when, the, when those sectors grow, your economy is more likely to grow. So we've been seeing so growth in mining, uh, mining was up. Mining has been up. Mining has been the best performing sector, and that's generally because alumina production is up. So the alumina production is the one that's coming from that's coming from Jamaica and Windalco. Bauxite is what um, whatever the new name is, but what Naranda used to be on the on the north coast. But I believe that I think there are opportunities in our quarry sector in our Quarried materials, so your know, limestone, silica, sand, gypsum materials, materials that are used to, to make cement, as well as we have been seeing some increases in in export in limestone. That so that port in that port in Otrius, the one that's right across from the cruise terminal, that that one is generally the lime the limestone port. Um, I heard the minister this year talking about the potential for Alpark to reopen. So that's something that I think would be interesting going moving along. And the sector, I put mixed value here because you saw that the sec that it only represents about 2% of GDP, but in terms of export income, it represents about 23% of export income, which is something that's really interesting about this particular sector. Um, agriculture, agriculture wasn't doing too well last year because um, growth, the 
weather conditions affected crop yields. And because the weather conditions affected the crop yields, we actually saw that moving through to, to food prices. And you did say we we're going to talk about inflation a little later. So mm-hmm. you kind of see that, you know, because we had increased food prices last year, we really had heightened inflation last year. I feel like there's um, never an ideal year for agriculture. Either it's <laughs> not enough rain or it's too much rain. <laughs> so, so that's so that's why my, my third suggestion there is that I think in terms of moving forward, we need to start looking at climate adaptive technologies. And so your, your hydroponics, your drip irrigation, and so on. So things, so things that can be more adaptive to either extreme heat or drought, as well as when you do have the one, the one or two instances of flooding. Coming right. down. Um, electricity and water supply. I know everybody knows. Everybody must know it has been hot. So it's no surprise that um, residential power is causing electricity and water supply levels to go up. And this is really on the side of what JPS and JPS and NWC as well as, as, well as independent power producers. That's it's really their 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 activity that's tracked in this sector. Um, we see some easing drought conditions from Western Jamaica. But what I think here, and I think this might this this is a this is something that I think will come out in the third quarter, is that if we can recall when the when the Prime Minister announced the new the new solar solar energy loans from NHT, I th- coming in July, I think that if there is that optic in the in or there is that optic or take up in those loans, I think we should see some increased activity in the sector in the third quarter. And if we're seeing that activity, then we could get to a state of net billing where larger larger producers might be able to sell back to the grid. I only have maybe about one or two more. Um, hotels and restaurants, that's tourist, sec- that's tourist sector. Um, last year, we got about 4.18 million visitors. Uh, it's now one of the record years, and on our side, we track um, we track tourism in a way that's looking at the implied demand, the actual demand, and the spending. So, not giving away any any of our secret sauce now, but the U.S. travel demand we see that that is increasing, which bodes well for Jamaica because the U.S. represents seventy percent of our tourism market, as well as we. We, similar to the tourism ministry, do think that they might get close to their five by five by five strategy, which is five million visitors by 2025, spending all five billion dollars. And I think we can segue after this. The construction sector is the worst performing sector. This one was a surprise. I didn't know that construction was down. What's going on there? So construction down four and a half percent, and the reasons given is that. There are fewer NHT housing starts. That was the reason highlighted um, from from PIOJ, as well as declining construction input sales, particularly from those of hardware, so hardware stores selling selling lumber, ply, and so on, as well as glass installation. And what and what I can see from my side is that we do have a higher interest rate environment in terms of financing. So. Real, so real estate, so we would see sort of a slowdown in um, real estate construction as financing becomes much more expensive on both the developer side as well as on the buyer side, where we have seen an increase in real mortgage rates. Yeah, so I think, oh, that makes yeah. sense. All right. All right. It makes sense. Makes sense. It makes sense. Good. Um, and there's one more slide. This is the inflation slide now. Um, the inflation I'm suggesting here is nearing its midpoint target. So you always hear the Bank of Jamaica talking about the target inflation of four to six percent, but they're really midpoint targeting up. Right. They're really targeting the five percent, mm-hmm. which is right, which is right in the middle. And we're seeing that the, the April figure was five point three percent, which is very very close. We we're waiting to see what the May figure is, and we'll see whether or not the Bank of Jamaica begins to make any moves. And we had 
Governor Biles on, um, I think it was last, last week. week. Last week, yeah. And that that was that was quite an interesting uh, discussion. It, for what? He, he actually had some choice words for your institution. I, I don't think he called you by name, but we know who he meant because he said the top two banks are NCB is the top. So in terms of volume. So let's play that clip from Governor Biles and I want you to respond. In Jamaica, we have uh, uh, 11 commercial banks and merchant banks, uh, but two of them in particular have about 60% of the deposits that are in the banks, especially savings deposits. Uh, and that means that two of them uh, really set the rate for the rest of the industry. Um, and to the extent that uh, those rates are the cheapest form of funding that the banks have, uh, they, are, they, they are not likely to want to raise those rates if they don't have to. But we would like to see them raise rates that they pay depositors and raise rates that they charge on loans. And what that does is slows the economy down, squeezes out inflation, and once we get inflation out, then we can lower interest rates again and get the economy to grow uh, at a faster pace once again. But because they have uh, such a large uh, portion of the cheap deposit funding, uh, they set the pace. And the way in which they have handled it in the last two and a half years is that they have barely moved the savings rates uh, and they have barely moved the lending rates. And that has had a negative effect on our monetary transmission system. And that has so had a to that, negative effect. Uh, so I'm going to say that I'm going to respond firstly in my you know technical capacity as an economist, but also but also adding in the color from my employer. So in so. The governor mentioned that we are sitting on, you know, a pile of cheap deposits. Um, while while there is while there is merit to that, there is a big part of a big part of the big part of the deposits are actually current accounts. And if you think about it, if you think about that current account activity, your salary is going to come in. You are going to um, take out your mortgage, take out your motor vehicle, take out your credit card, take out all the other expenses. And at the end of the month, there isn't that much left to add interest to. Now, if there isn't that much to add interest to, then there isn't that much from that type of account to actually lend to. So that's one side of it. So a lot of the accounts that we have are actually current accounts, which are also very high, high transactional accounts, which means that we have to maintain quite a bit of cash in order to ensure that those accounts are adequately funded. So that's one side of it. The other side of it, um, mentioning the movement of the the actual movement of the rates. Now, the if we if we look on the data that the BOJ actually has, BOJ started their rate adjustments in September 2021. And up until this point, the the actual saving, the actual, the actual deposit rate, which I think is the rate where people are, where, where the BOJ is more, is actually more invested in us moving. That rate overall for the industry, on there are three types, three types of deposit rates: so time deposits, demand deposits, savings deposits. And just from, and just from the data pool between September twenty twenty one to April twenty twenty four, the Time deposits increased by 140%. And those go in line with the BOJ rate. So the time deposit average rate is about 6.2%, which is short, which is a little short Wait, of what the is, what is that time deposit? So the time so the time deposits are period-based deposits. So you can have 30 days, so you can have one month, three month, nine month, 12, 12 month call deposits so those are so Fixed those are deposits yes essentially so okay. those rates those rates actually moved as fast as the policy interest rate so th so i don't think anybody has a problem with those rates the issue is the demand and the savings deposits and i think a, 
and I think I mentioned that based on the type of accounts that we have, the money doesn't necessarily stay in there for the vast majority of our customers. And But those rates, so like demand, demand deposits move from 0.69% to 1.37%. That's almost that's almost double that's a 98 percent movement and the savings deposits which i think most people are interested in so that so that's your regular savings account that actually moved by 156 percent so it moved from 40.41.41 percent in september 2021 to one to 1.05 percent currently which is 156 percent yay one so, percent interest so um yeah. Um, it's 1.05, just, um, sorry. Let me not leave off the 0.05. Okay. I, I will concur. They might seem low, but we have to remember where rates are coming from. Rates are coming from half a percent. BOJ, the BOJ policy interest rate used to be half a percent. When I started the industry in 2016, it was 5%. And in 2019, it went down to half a percent. Twenty twenty Between 2021, and between September 2021 and November 2022, the rate moved up by 650 basis points or between half a percent and 7% and has been there since. So um, the BOJ has its latitude to move its, poli to move its policy interest rate but on our side, we all we also have to look at some of the other factors. That, yeah, but, but that, you guys are charging minimum eight percent on loans, eight nine percent on loans, and you're giving us one percent. That that's a pretty big spread in your favor. Let me let me add another bit of color to that argument in terms of the eight percent. So if we're so if for example, lucky to get eight percent. 8.5 right. at minimum. So if we have to go to the Bank of Jamaica window in to borrow to borrow money to lend. So if I, so it, so if you so if so if you follow my drift, liquidity is low in the market. We know that because BOJ raised rates, liquidity has been dried up. We we from time to time have to go to the BOJ window to borrow money. We're borrowing money at 10% as the standing liquidity. If, the standing liquidity finance facility of BOJ is at ten percent, so they might give us seven percent on our current on our current account, but when we go to the window, we're borrowing at ten percent. So if you look on the so if you look on the difference from the ten, where we're actually getting the bulk of money to on lend, then it's now from ten you might go to twenty odd for you might go to twenty for personal unsecured loans. But for your secured facilities, we're anywhere between 11 and about 13 percent, which is where um, mortgage rates are, auto loans are, and so on, which is just about two to three percent between that rate that we would borrow money from BOJ from. So that justifies that widespread. What I'm saying is, if you look on it, it's actually not that wide. It's actually it's it's it's. Actually, not that oh, wide, so, and then so you're you're then, using the spread between what you borrow from BOJ at and what you on lend at. But I'm talking about the difference between what you pay to depositors and what you lend at. So I I lend you my money. If I'm a depositor, I'm essentially lending you my money. Uh, so so, and I so essentially, if you're saying that, all right, that. we're getting so I think the better part of the the, the, the we'd move to if we're getting seven percent on the current account from BOJ. And the rates are at about one percent. What is what is the reason for that spread between the one and the seven? That's the that's the that's the bigger spread. For example, um, remember, it does it is quite an expensive industry, and I say that in the sense that we are called out in terms of competition um, based on the market structure or based on the market conditions the banking sector is more than likely going to be oligopoly with a few large players. In 2016, it was six commercial banks. 2017, it, it moved up to eight. And it was six because of movements over time, consolidations, and so on. So um, you have that to contend with. You also have to contend with the higher barriers to entry, the actual cost of getting that banking license, 
as well as the enhanced regulations with it. We do pay the highest taxes. We pay 33 and a third percent tax on our profits. And we also pay the asset tax, which we gave back to the government of Jamaica right, right in the beginning of COVID. So um, it does it does cost us quite a bit to actually provide services. I can give you from the NCV point of view. We have, 20, we have 27 branches. We do have 300 or 300 ABMs. We have the most ABMs in the system. We also have the most point of sales in the system. So in order to keep that system flowing, it does cost quite a bit. Um, I think you would have seen over the last, right again, I think you would have seen over the last few, few months with our the chairman talking about our EGC push and one of those things that we're trying to get. Oh, by the way, congratulations things. on the APO closing. Happy thank to you, that. thank you. Um, APO closed um, recently and we're still crunching numbers. So yeah. you'll see a release soon enough in terms of but, the performance. Nicole, I'm, I'm not going to pressure you any further <laughs> on the inflation, on the spreads issue and what banks charge. I know you're not the mm. boss, you're not in charge. I am, so I am not. Thing. It came always that we need McCall to keep his work. So. Please, 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 please. So in the words of Richard Biles, let's move on. Let's move on. Let me introduce David to the panel. David, good evening. Welcome back. Thanks again, Kalila. Glad to be back. <laughs> so today we are looking at Carib Cement. Carib Cement has reintroduced dividends or they've restarted their dividend program. Give us the update on Carib. So, for context, it's relating to the whole Semex group, basically, Kalila, not just to Carib Cement alone. So, just to give some context, Semex is the ultimate parent company at the top. That company is listed on the New York Stock Exchange and on the Mexican Stock Exchange. Then, you have Trinidad Cement Limited, which is also owned majority by Semex. And then, Antisa has majority shares in Carib Cement. So three companies, Cemex, Trinidad Cement, then Carib Cement. Carib Cement restarted its dividend payments back in 2022, 17 years post its last dividend payment. They paid $1.5 billion back in 2021, apologies, 2022, and in 2023, they paid about $1.9 billion. So that's to kind of show you that it's a significant step up because in, 20, in 2005, they paid seven cents, which is about $55 million. So $55 million then to be paying now 1.5, 1.9 billion J. Big step up, right? Then last week, Monday, Trinidad Cement Limited, which owns 74.08% of <clears throat> Carib Cement here in Jamaica, they announced their first dividend payment in over, over what? Seven years. Because the last payment was back in 2017 and that was two cents. Trinidad Cement has announced an eight cent dividend to be confirmed and approved at its AGM next month, either this month or next month. And then, you know, this announcement was preceded by Semex, the ultimate parent company, announced that it has actually restarted its own dividend program and it's planning to pay out US $120 million over the next four quarters. And we may start this month. So next have last paid its own dividend to its own shareholders back in 2019. <clears throat> so I mentioned all of these facts to kind of show you that coming down the list of companies, you realize that shareholders were not getting any dividends over this period of time. It's really been what you'd call, I should say, tough luck or you know, just bitter medicine. But Carib Cement, you know, we reached after 17 years. They have been there meeting this week to recommend a dividend to be confirmed at the AGM later this year to pay to shareholders. That's likely to be very large because right now, Carib Cement is actually, for one, debt free. Key point they're debt free right now. They are expanding their capacity by 30%, which is equivalent to about 27%. Of the country's national cement consumption, the airport tax and care costs, and they plan to export to other markets once the expansion is done. And you're still talking about the reality of having 
12,000 hotel rooms being developed <clears throat> over the next, within 2024, 2026, alongside other elements of construction in the domestic market. With respect to Trinidad Cement Limited, the good thing for them is Carrier Cement is performing. And the reason why I say it in such a way is that if you were to remove Carib Cement's performance out of uh, Trinidad Cement Limited's numbers, go to the annual report, just go to the NCI in the country interest area, look at how they did their calculation and actually pull out Carib Cement, the overall goes into a loss automatically. So because Trinidad Cement owns majority interest in Carib Cement, they're having positive numbers. And because the Jamaica business, in this case, Carib Cement is paying dividends, Trinidad Cement cannot pay dividends. And Trinidad Cement is owned by a CEMEX subsidiary, which means that money can flow out as well of the CEMEX. A CEMEX mm -hmm. subsidiary owns 4.96% of Carib Cement directly. So overall, CEMEX, in essence, owns about 79.04% of Carib Cement. So it's a lot of information to take in, but hope that makes some sense. So it really was just a, a patience game for Carib Cement shareholders. 17 years, Kadila? That's an entire child. That's an entire child. That's it, really to put is. It. it really is. So what's the what's the ex dividend date for somebody to be able to benefit from the next Carib dividend? It doesn't mean announced as yet. So what Carib Cement does is that they follow their all the follow the Cemex model, which is the board will recommend a dividend. It will go to the shareholder meeting to be approved, and then it's paid out. So we're looking at it probably around September slash October, for that dividend payment, probably earlier around August. So it's, it's around this window between August to October when you're going to actually see that payment. What we don't know as yet is when that carrier cement agent is actually going to be held. So that's the big wild card in the room right now. But Repetition Dell Cement Limited, shareholders would have to be on record as at August 13 to get dividend payment in on September 9. So you still have time to move if you want to benefit from that dividend. This is the time Basically, to now on August, and thing, early August. And the thing is, Carib Cement, you know, their first quarter results looked significantly improved over the prior year, but that was because in 2023 Q1, they had a general shutdown for maintenance, which why numbers look so much better. But even in 2023, when there was a relative slowdown in cement demand, you know, they were still able to generate their highest level of revenue and profit to date, $27 billion worth of revenue and $5 billion worth of net profit, 20% net profit margin, which is still pretty good. And if you look at Carib Cement's books right now, they have seen a whole lot of cash, at least $6 billion in cash. And they're just selling cement like, wow. All right, so we look out for that. Thanks so much for that update, David. You're welcome, Kalila. And this is my final two points. Uh, read the whole taxi announcement earlier it is a little bit short-sighted and someone to me that very highly strong point of they skipped regulation and went straight to ban the reality is jamaica faces a current situation whereby we don't have enough jutc or to call the Public transport operations well, specifically, you know, the ones that provided by the government, and even though you right. have other licensed alternatives in the case of the point passenger vehicles, like your coast air little minibuses and taxis that carry particular routes, the Ubers and the alternative options, they do serve a market for persons who want, you know, to work on their own time potentially. That's for the driver on their side. And for the for the passenger, they get to their destination without breaking bank. You know. We saw the news on Monday, you know, with respect to the teacher, and then it's her family. And it is a very unnecessary blanket ban to just basically throw out the entire industry over what you one would call one rogue player in a sense. So the regulation is needed, but to just outright ban the industry is not going to solve the problem. It's only going to create additional issues because the persons who work in these spaces that's just income for, for them because they might have to run in the risk now of operating outside of the remit of the law. And also, persons who use these services to get around and get around on a time 
they're going to basically be fighting to haggle with the remaining operators or the older more established operators to get a cab. So you're shrinking supply, but the demand is still there. Basic economics tell you is that the price is going to go up or you're going to have a situation of a shortage. So I hope that makes some level of sense. I'm sure Mika would have added that comment right here, but that is, those are my two cents on the whole issue. All right. Thanks so much, David. We appreciate it as usual. We'll take our final break and come back with your comments. This segment of Taking Stock, the Analysts, was brought to you by JMMB Group.